Welcome to Sonic Legacies, a series of talks on sound and our past, hosted by DHI Art Space. I'm Gautam Temaraj. Today we meet a researcher and an artist whose work is not just unique, but is rare. Through his work, we are able to get a sense of our ancient past through an uncommon vantage point, which requires our ears rather than our eyes. The relationship between space and sound is a fundamental one. Sound travels through a space and is contained by it. The sound that we hear in an auditorium is very different from that which we hear in an office space. Space defines sound and sound indicates the nature of a space. Reverberation amplifies sound, making a sound last longer through a slower decay and through consonants, whereby the mid-range frequencies, mostly of human speech, are reinforced. The Australian author and artist Peter Doyle interestingly points out here that several architectural spaces of antiquity, the temples, ziggurats, tombs, and palaces of the past were highly reverberant spaces. The augmented voice in these spaces, architecturally amplified, quote, must have held special connotations, unquote. Similarly, in modern buildings from libraries, courts, and churches to galleries, there appear acoustic qualities that approximate the notion of wrapping the voice with a stentorian gravitas. One could surmise, he writes on, that this aura of reverberation was associated with the pronouncements of emperors and satraps, magistrates and governors. We have also fantastic whispering galleries, including the most prominent one in India, the Gold Gumbas at Bijapur, which furthers this dense relationship between space and sound. What can we learn from this ancient, mysterious and complex relationship in terms of our past? What sonic legacies have we inherited over time? It is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Uma Shankar Mantravadi, a sound technician, researcher, and artist who has pioneered the field of archaeoacoustics in India. He has created unique sound recordings at ancient archaeological sites in order to study them through acoustic principles. This endeavor yields a unique insight into our past beyond what we understand from archaeological remains and written and oral accounts. Mr. Mantravadi is responsible for several endeavors in the sonic realm, from artistic projects, research, and archival work, amongst others. Welcome, Mr. Mantravadi, and I'll, I'll thank you for taking the time to talk to us. I'll jump right in. Could you tell us what archaeoacoustics is and how you became interested in the field? You see, archaeoacoustics basically defines itself as study of acoustics of ancient spaces. I narrow it a little more. I, uh, I've been looking at spaces from 3rd century BC to about 5th, 6th century AD, because the, this is the region when machine-made noise, man-made noises were at a very low level. So uh, people were more sensitive to what the, the kind of sound the space produced. So I'm interested in that kind of spaces because that gives me some idea of the uh, sensitive sensibilities of people of that time. Uh, once you come into the machine age, your sensibilities have become less because there's too much noise and spell. So, the, so that, that's the range. But archaeoacoustics actually covers a very wide range, uh, all the way go to uh, uh, study of uh, ancient cave painting sites of cave, cave paintings. A lot of work has been done on sites of cave paintings in Europe and in South America. That's, but uh, I have not been doing that. I have been only looking at, uh, you know, my earliest site is Rani Gumpa, which is 3rd century BC. And the most recent is probably uh, uh, this, uh, it's about 11th century. It is, uh, uh, this is in Kerala. You must be having documentation about it because I have, I have written about it. And all that. Uh, so how did, okay. you, how did you become interested in the field, uh, Mr. Umashankar? Uh, you see, I worked in an archives of Indian music from 1982 onwards till about five years ago when I decided it's time to retire. But in the, there I met uh, 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 an American theater historian called Tom Alt. And Professor Alt was interested in the acoustics of uh, Rani Gumpa, but he was not interested in anything else because his close friend was uh, 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 in Orissa and he was. He wanted to prove that this is actually a theater built according to Bharata's Natashastra, the rules of Natashastra. Uh, and I was asked to do, if I could do acoustic measurements to prove this. And uh, I was quite aware right from the beginning that acoustic measurements don't prove very much. 
but you can get an idea of what it's like. And I was, you know, this is the first time I was looking at acoustics of an ancient space. So I wasn't sure of what I would get. In fact, I didn't even know what equipment I would need, but that's where I started. Could you uh, talk about that first uh, visit to Rani Gumpa? And, uh, you know, you mentioned that the uh, builders could have possibly made a structure akin to a musical instrument. Could you talk about that? See, Rani Gumpa was a major area of study for me because I went five or six times to that place. But the very first time I went, you know, it, it's a, a slight uh, slope, down slope, and then you see the uh, structure. The structure was carved into half a mountain. You know, they cut off half a mountain and made a two-story uh, two structure, very much like a theater, even if you don't want to say theater. But as you walk into the space, your the, the sound you hear changes, and it changes dramatically. And uh, that is what actually hooked me into acoustics. It's the sound I heard at Rani Gumpa. Because, you know, once you walk in and you walk towards the stage side of the thing, you, when you speak, everybody can hear you for a, if there are a thousand people, you know, in a space for a thousand people audience. And probably everybody in the audience can hear you if you talk at normal speaking levels from the stage. And you get off the stage, that effect disappears. And this is very obvious, you don't need measurements. And that's when I decided I, I do need to do this a bit because nobody else is going to do it. Then we also took measurements of the space. Bharata actually doesn't give you too much information how this theater should be built, but it gives proportions. You know, half the stage, half the, the volume of the space should be stage and half should be audience. And one third of that should be the, uh, the Nepa Jagraha, the back this space. It, it, it's all divisions, it, it, but it doesn't give you specific numbers. So the what uh, you know, there's this very nice clean stage on the upper floor of uh, Rani Gupta, but it, it is longer and narrower than uh, Bharata wanted it to be. Uh, in terms of uh, mapping acoustically, mapping the space at Rani Gumpa and making those uh, yeah. recordings, what uh, <laughs> what value or what is gained through that process? I mean, it, it I think for a lay uh, person. Uh, just understanding the idea of making these recordings may not be immediately accessible. How would you describe? Uh, In fact, that is a, that is one of the things about running if I realize that I can say it sounds wonderful. I can take these measurements. I got better and better at the measurements. Because initially, I also did not know too much acoustics. I'm a sound recorder rather than an acoustician. So it, it took me a few years to figure out exactly. And one of the great good fortunes was I met online Somebody called Angelo Farina, who is an acoustics uh, professor at uh, Parma. And they have wonderful sites to measure as well, apart from being one of the world's, probably Europe's oldest university. And uh, he was very interested in what I was doing. And he helped me a lot, in both in terms of technology, in terms of suggestions, and what to read. You know, all these things you need in the beginning, you don't know. But uh, you, even at that point, when I was doing very basic measurements, I realized my measurements will not tell anybody how good a space is. Finally, they have to listen to me. And I, I say it is good. And these measurements are for other acoustics scholars to, to see if what I did was right. Uh, in some sense, you're creating a bank of uh, data and knowledge and forms that can be yeah. for other scholars. Yeah, other scholars. It's basically meant for other scholars rather than for but um, I, I was always interested in what people could hear rather than what I could write down on a piece of paper. So I, my first attempt at uh, making it available was to build a uh, computer model of that space. You see, there was also a second problem. Uh, okay, it sounds good. Why does it sound good? And how much was deliberate? You know, these are questions you have to ask at every uh, archaeological site. I was interested in two things. Why? Was it accidental? It did not look accidental primarily because it's very narrow range of effect. You stand on the stage and you have this beautiful sound. You get off stage, it is not there. You can't, be, if you are in outdoor space, you have to shout to be heard. So that part makes you think it's deliberate. Second is how did they achieve it? So this, how did they achieve it was for me. I, I, the, I, I built a 3D model using a program called CAT Acoustic. It took me a year because, I, again, I was just beginning. So I was learning a lot of things, including 3D modeling. And, uh, and then the author of the 
characteristic he said you build it and send me the model and i will send you uh, the, the kind of sound you hear and in and in particular i was interested in one change that happens at the back there are a lot of small rooms which the archaeological survey thinks are used for monks to sleeping but uh, they are unconnected rooms but all connected to the stage you can't even see them very clearly from the stage but they are acoustically connected i want to see what happens if i remove those you know if they are deliberately there. so we, he did those tests for me and said yes there is a particular kind of this thing the reverberation is caused by these small spaces at the back and he was able to show me how the spaces are affecting the sound and he sent me a test result so uh, that was one thing i could say, tell you know i could play the sound see this is what it will sound like if there are no, no, no structures and this is what it sounds like with the structures which is a useful thing to do the other thing was around that time we were also getting into ambisonics ambisonics is a way of recording with complete acoustics three dimensional acoustics we don't do that with a single omni mic or with a stereo mic or even with five point these are all created the spaces whereas with ambisonics you capture the space as it exists the other thing that ha- was happening at the same time was zoom produced two recording models zoom h2 and zoom h4 i removed the internal mics and made a stem with an ambisonic mic on top and uh, that was the uh, made it suddenly possible to take a small portable recorder and do ambisonic measurements with ambisonics of the first thing that you get and it's such a pleasure to have that is your recording is re- recording with height and with full three dimensions and it's completely uh, it, it will pick up the same way whichever direction the sound is coming from so if you put a mic where roughly or slightly the way you want to sit and listen in an auditorium it is picking up the direct sounds and all the reflections at the same relate relation levels as if as in the room itself so when you play it back with a proper system you need at least eight loud speaker then you are recreating all the reflection in the correct places not they are not coming from the same speaker as the music so, so you no longer have to worry yeah so uh, basically uh, we're talking about a more accurate representation of spatial dimensions uh, through yeah. a recording so you're yeah. offering the listener ultimately the listener or the researcher the you're yeah. offering a more accurate representation of the space exactly and what happens is with uh, one of the things is when when i do a, uh, i can do a test in an acoustic archaeological site by putting my mic and 2 meters away hold a balloon and pop it and record the balloon pop i'll get uh, four recordings on my four track then i pre- produce a b format version of it i can use that to process any performance anywhere to make it sound like it's coming from there because the information about the acoustics of that space are in that pop we call it an impulse response it's about 200k per channel so it's a very small file but it has enough information for you to recreate that's a very interesting proposition uh, uh, mr uma shankar it's almost like you're placing the listener or the researcher who's listening to these recordings uh, temporarily in another situation and spatially in another yeah. situation which is closer to uh, what would have happened at rani gumpa thousands of years ago yeah that's exactly what i see the, the, this the, for me as i said right from the beginning my limit, the pro- problem i saw, always saw is i know it is sounding good but how do i communicate what i think is sounding good this is a very good way of communicating that you know i can actually set up uh, 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 in my house for people to come and listen to the same performance in different i can now do it in seven places seven or eight places i can also have people give them this uh, measurement uh, impulse response i don't own them and uh, anybody can actually play around with it you know you can have a rock concert in rani gumpa which archaeological survey won't allow you to but you can do it so it, it, it's a sort of thing that i like because it, and the other thing is uh, we we think of these structures as permanent but they are not you know there there people monkeys children they breaking off bits of this thing and the archaeological survey is trying to improve these which sometimes not a very good thing to do 
and uh, before you know it the the acoustic of this movement which actually is not the acoustic when it was constructed but what is left of it will also go but these measurements will not go so you do you say what did it what did rani gumpa sound like in 2010 i can take out a measurement and say this is what it sounds like we do another recording now and say this is what has happened because you planted trees where the people sleep because you beautified it you know that's what they have actually done they have planted a lot of trees where it is a bare ground so it is bare ground because there is an audience uh, could one say that um, you were recreating uh, or uh, rediscovering a, uh, a sort of a sonic history a sonic legacy uh, through very contemporary means i would i would not say recreating i would say providing the tools for recreating i'm not doing it myself i'm just measuring and those measurements become the tools for a musician or a you know there's one of the things that's happening a lot of these days a lot of electronic music composers are into uh, the thing of uh, sound space you know earlier electronic music was basically the instruments and not too much about how it sounds like in a particular now they're very uh, the compositions themselves are 3d they're composing for 30 lux speakers which means you need more spaces to perform in and uh, one of the things i'm fiddling with is trying to design a portable 30 lux speaker or 16 lux speaker system which we can set up in any space and have performance we to do those things uh, amisonics becomes the starting point this leads me to a couple of slightly abstract questions uh, related mm. to the nature of sound and space um yeah you think these old sonic traces of the past not really what they hold is a structure that was done in the past that includes the sonic traces but it is not you know it it, 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 it happened once and i was doing measurements in the middle of the night in lani kumpa it's very senior officer of uh, archaeological survey asked me can you hear them and i said hear what he said he thought i will had some magic uh, not magic some extraordinary technology which allowed me to listen to the people who are who have built the structure no i can't see there there is a very limited transmission of what was intended and what i am hearing for hmm. one thing i do not know what they actually meant to use this space for if for instance if it is buddhist there are some uh, texts which suggests that they use uh, very often preached as a uh, two person dialogue so they could have used it for something else it, it, i would I, I, in fact that's one of the things i worry about when people say theater is that we don't know what theater was like in the 3rd century it was around the time bharata was there bharata's text is more about play, the play than about the perform space we can only know so much about these places especially this was particularly true when i went to nagarjuna konda there is a place called anupu where there is a theater and anupu theater is actually the, the amphitheater not a theater because it is very deliberately outdoor but it has got this uh, two structure the stage side of it has two structures which look like uh, you know two people uh, the counter arguing or doing a, you know it could be something like that you know in those days you could actually build a theater for a, for a particular kind of performance not for generalized performance so we don't know what those perform so uh so, you are you speculating that it might be uh, something where it's kind of like a uh, buddhist dialectics used to be conducted yeah that, that, that's the, that's the feeling you get but you know i have to be very careful about saying this is what it is because i don't know i mean i am very aware of what is happening in the 5th century in nagajapan and it is big structure is beautifully built and they reconstructed it quite accurately they moved it a little but it is not in the museum it's it's at village of anupu what and, what, uh, what are the sir, recordings like uh, mr umesh ankar of anupu anupu again has a, you know they all the three the, the three places they have done very good measurement uh uttambalam in uh, this uh, tsur uh, and uh, anupu and ranigumpa 
they have one kind of they almost like they share an acoustic sensibility that is they have they have reverberation strong reverberation strong in terms of it, it is quite but it's not a long reverberation it doesn't go on for one minute it, it is not like an echo but it's strong reverberation so voices get amplified they sound much richer than they would if you did you know the measure the, the comparison of this if you had the same amount of space flat with nothing constructed what would it sound like so that is what they have added and that the addition seems to be you know the, the, in the, the thrissur kuttambalam is built of uh, uh, wood it is a wooden structure so it's been rebuilt a few times since it was originally built 13th century or so it is a solid copper roof the roof it's not solid you know the roof plates are an inch or two inches thick it is not a small narrow and that heavy copper roof seems to do something to the structure but you get the same uh, reverberant effect that you get with the uh, uh, rani gumpa the rani gumpa is built completely differently you know it, it tries to look as open space as possible well. anupu doesn't try to look you know it is it it, it 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 also has one stage side and one open side but apart from that they, they don't look at all like each other they weren't you know uh, rani gumpa is carved from native rock they took a mountain cut off half and carved the face of that uh, half into a theater you can't get so nothing changes there anupu is built of brick anupu is typical buddhist construction brick with a facing they, they would have cut up a stone facing which is missing mostly but uh, the technique was uh, completely different but what they were trying to get and uh, for me that that there is amazing that there is a certain kind of they wanted a certain kind of sound because that the kind of sound you hear in all these secrets hmm. because otherwise i wouldn't dare to say they wanted because you know this is what i'm hearing today but i don't know what they wanted when they built it and what but one of the things i am quite sure of our hearing hasn't changed it is wait what it was 3000 3000 years ago 5000 years ago what is what has changed is the background Hmm. the the change of background is affects the way we listen to things not in a very obvious for instance one of the things i was interested in trishu which i know chakun because getting permissions and things is not always the easiest is we see the, the performance at trishu is classic of a certain kind of we in telugu it's called vidhi bhagavatam but all these have one thing they have very loud percussion and voices and these days you have to have a loudspeaker for the voice in order to hear it over the percussion it did not develop at a time when there were loudspeakers how were they able to perform uh, uh, these plays with these very loud drums accompanying the singer when nowadays you can't hear the singer at all because of the drums they could when the, because see the performance has not been rearranged but uh, the, the, the the reason they could hear is this is hypothesis i wanted to test it is uh, we, we have what is called a threshold for sound if you move the threshold down you hear the softer sounds loud sounds will stay where they are to hear the softer sounds the background threshold has to go down when you don't have auto rickshaws going down the road you can hear softer sounds without the loud sounds becoming any louder you know it's not like amplification it is here so the 300 years ago these performances the loud drums were had their place and the soft singer had his place and both were audible in the same space they no longer are now because of the change in the acoustic characteristics of it. that sort of thing one can say sound yeah. as a area of research has always uh, seemed to be lower in hierarchy compared to visual and tactile cultures um how do you see this uh, proposition as a sound recorder i hate it but the point is it is not really true the, 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 the sound is the picture has a way of grabbing your attention that sound doesn't have sound is subtler but but, but the thing is it is the last sense you lose when you're dying i'm told it will be there when everything else has left you and uh, most cultures take sound actually more seriously than it seems you know if they didn't they would not uh, be building all these complicated structures the performance did not require all this if it's a visual performance 
because there is some sound element which was more important it has become less important from about 18th century and even then uh, for instance when film came for about 30 years it stayed silent but uh, the thing was there was constant attempt to add sound to the picture it is not as if they ignored it it is just that the technology makes it easier to do sound in some way and uh, the so social for instance i know what happens when a sound recording goes on location he is alone the cameraman has got five people standing around him one pulling focus one set just the, the amount of attention camera demands it is not it demands a retention sound doesn't a good sound recording is invisible i would like to ask you about the uh, the sound archive that will, that you helped set up in gurgaon yeah. talk about the, work, yeah. the nature of that archive see that archive was started by nazir jaras boy who was a uh, used from india and uh, he moved on to england and when partition happened and then suddenly it became quite poor he was teaching sitar his mother was sitar player and he learned sitar and he was teaching sitar uh, in in london and he also was producing a program on bbc about indian music very early 50s when this casting went in and then slow and he worked with a very major scholar called arnold dakhe he stayed in india during the entire war and stayed with ramana tagore a friend of ramana tagore and what he did was he set up a studio baker van with a very primitive form of recording system and went around the country recording everywhere he recorded anything somebody was crying he recorded the crying you know so you have a lot of funeral crying recordings that he did you know funeral crying was ritual it is not as if you anybody can cry you hire somebody to cry so and nazir worked with him and uh, and one result of that was nazir became interested in recording indian music he recorded a lot of music in bombay and he brought students from first uh, england and then america because he moved on to canada and then to finally to ucla california and he did a lot of recording uh, and he wanted right from the beginning one of the things he felt very bad wrong strongly was there a lot of people are recording in india but where is that music going is not coming back and uh, i mean they don't it's not that they don't want it to come back right? there's no means so you wanted to set up a center where anybody who records indian music will deposit so basically international basically american because of the had influence it took about it took about 5 or 6 years to set it up and i i made friends with him because i went on field trips with him a couple of times and uh, so he wanted me to be the first technician in that place so i joined in 1982 so my first job was to go to california and buy all the equipment needed for this revox and things like that and and also a, a slightly more experimental I, i we bought a tcm f1 digital recorder which recorded to video tape it was the first consumer digital recorder made and we still have it in gurgaon and uh, somewhere in the 90s somebody developed a little card which allowed you to output digitally so we have digital recordings going back to 83 in the archive so the, the, he wanted to set it up and uh, he, he couldn't set it up as an individual he set it up in as part of the american institute of indian studies and uh, it's not still there and it's got about 25 30 000 hours of recordings and uh, i worked for off in between i moved out and then i came back but i stayed with them till i decided of retiring and came off to bangalore live in this little place in bangalore so and uh, so the, what the, the, right from beginning we had some attitudes which were very important one was it is a public access it's a library second was performers rights are sacrosanct you can't give people copies because it's not yours you are only you are storing them you can let people listen but they can't take copies now it's becoming a little easier to give copies because of digital technology and all that so the third we did right from the beginning we were going to create a, a standard database system for the archives we bought an apple 2 plus computer they back then or the best you could buy then move down here to it is now an all digital archive everything in the archive is on the high quality digital format and we have 
hard disks with backup and all, all the things that you have to develop for a digital system. That, that was, I was there for, for all that to happen. So I was involved in a, not, not, uh, the sound recording part is the least of it because you just have to take care of other people's recording. And you know, one of the things you learn is every day I, I listen to different material, not that I was going to listen to the same material. Because people came from all sorts of things. And somebody has worked for one year in uh, some part of uh, uh, Rajasthan and they come back with the recordings. And you have never heard that kind of material before. I, I have heard recordings from Ganjam district in Telugu, which I never I didn't even know existed. You know, they, they are doing a Ramayana story. And uh, the, the, the guy who recorded it says they're actually beggars because I can understand because the language spoken in that area is Odia. They are, they are Telugu folk performers there. And uh, they perform, they get invited once in a while, they don't have too much money. But an incredible uh, this thing of performance. You know, you see so much of this performance in so many places. And everywhere, what you really get under your skin is how much work they put in to do these things. So your pitch should be correct. You know, spend hours tuning their instrument. They may be made from a dal dal tin, but it's tuned. <laughs> so you, you learn something about the seriousness with which they do it. And I worked 30 years plus in that place. You know, it, it uh, sort of tunes you into a certain, attunes you to a certain seriousness. You know, you have to take these things seriously. It is not, it, it, they're not playing. I'd like to ask you also about your artistic collaborations. Uh, I, uh, I, you've done quite a few over the years. Yeah, mostly over the last 10 years. Uh, mostly because I met a Nida uh, House who used to work in Bombay Art Room. And uh, she wanted to do something about sound, so she came to ARC. A lot of things happened because I was sitting there and everybody said, okay, let's talk to him. <laughs> he might have something to say. And uh, she and uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan is England and is uh, half Lebanese and half English, He's born in England. And uh, they wanted me to join them in the kind of uh, using acoustics as an art form. And uh, of course, mine, I, I was doing what I was doing. And uh, the three of us together, we did a project in Dubai first. Where, uh, it, is, it was a performance. First time I've done something like that. It was a performance. We were under, we were not visible. Nobody could see us. We gave everybody headphones and there was a screen where my ambisonic mic could be. It, 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 mic was mounted in the middle of the performance. And uh, I could rotate it because I can rotate it in software, not in hardware. I don't have to go there. So these 50 people heard our talk. And then when they asked a question, I could rotate to face the person who asked me the question. Simultaneously on screen, you can see the image of the, uh, the, the mic pattern changing, changing direction. And so they were doing things like that, you know, basically trying to, again, you know, it always comes down to trying to get people involved in what you're doing. And I, I, I still am very, I don't always want to say artist because that's not exactly, I do what artists would do, but I'm, I'm doing it for other reasons. I would like to bring up the idea of sound as a source of knowledge and history. I mean, through your research, recordings, conservation work and artistic work and your, uh, you know, um, uh, archaeoacoustic work. I mean, there seems mm -hmm. to be, uh, you've created a unique body of uh, material, data, knowledge, whatever one calls it. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. see this on the continuum of... Um, you see, Okay, sorry. I, I know what I want to say. That's why I started. No, I want people to learn to do it. You know, for the measurements, something I've been, I did one IFA grant where I took people, but I took senior people, not students, to teach them how I do acoustic measurements. Similarly, I, we are now trying to set up a project where I build low cost equipment, basically a zoom with a built in tetrahedral mic and balloons and tape, measuring tape. So that they can set it up exactly, take a photograph, do the, start the recorder, pop the balloon, come back with these and sit and produce a body of measurements. And I want them to do it. One of the things I've, I've been wanting right from the beginning is it's not enough to do ancient and important sites. Any site is an acoustic site. You want to know why 
This is one of the things I never did it. it was uh, again name name problems. The singer in uh, Indoor, very famous uh, classical music singer. His house, he had built it as a uh, rehearsal studio. Lot of wood, very reverberant. And this particular tradition, Tanpura sound is very critical. They spend a really long time getting the Tanpura to sound exact. So this space reflects that. And I wanted to measure it because you know it is private home. Not uh, and uh, before you know it, ah, it is in a place called Devas, near Indore. And uh, before you know it, somebody will say, "Let's build a multi-story building." You know, it is a small town, but becoming big and rich, and it even got its own airport. So these things will happen. You have to protect the performance. You have to record it. I mean, I would like. I, I wish I could go and do a lot of the recordings I had done in Nagra, now in Andersonic, because a lot of the performance are moving performance. They are not sitting down. And it would be much more interesting. I've done one in Anupu. I recorded one. Uh, uh, again, names are a big problem for me. I recorded a performance last time, uh, two years ago, uh, of these performers from Hyderabad, three uh, singing in a circle, and my mic in the middle. The recording is there on online. So much, Uncle. Thanks so much for taking the time. It was really interesting. I mean, there uh, there are many, particularly uh, the. Uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, conservation and preservation uh, linked to kind of how things move and change and become mobile over time. This is very interesting. Yeah. So thanks very much for taking the time to speak to me. Okay.